Hello and welcome to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. WA Real is about real and authentic stories from fascinating people here in Western Australia. Stories to inspire you to take action to be all that you can be. And today's story will be no different to that. Um, Pediatric haematologist and oncologist and associate professor at University of Notre Dame, Angela Alessandri. Born and bred in WA, you attended the medical school at UWA doing the bulk of your medical training in Perth. You spent four years in Vancouver completing your fellowship in pediatric haematology and oncology. During this time, you were awarded the Laura and Greg Norman National Childhood Cancer Foundation Fellowship. Returning to Perth in 2001, you took up the position as consultant clinical pediatrician, haematologist, oncologist at Princess Margaret Hospital. Uh, and in your time, you've also been the department head. In 2015, you, you joined the School of Medicine at the Notre Dame University, been involved in the physician wellness program and the development of a positive workplace program. You're also a keen traveler and photographer from what I gather, which you combine on multi-day hikes. Angela, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Bryn. It's lovely to be here. Cool. And I'm glad I got through that introduction <laughs> with all those uh, great long words, which I do actually know. Um, so you were born and bred here in Western Australia. What Can you tell us a bit, what is it like growing up here? Well, I was, but I probably didn't have the completely typical Australian uh, upbringing in that I'm really first generation Australian. So my dad came to Perth from Italy in his 20s and my mum was born here just, um, but her first language was Croatian. Right. So my grandfather um, came on my mother's side, came from Croatia and took 12 years to um, call for his wife. Right. Um, uh, who oh, wow. brought one child who was 11 and a half. Unfortunately, she lived through quite a tragedy in that her three other children had died in the Spanish flu. Um, and not long after she came, you know, my mum was born within a year of her coming to Perth. So, and then my uncle. So my mum, um, spoke Croatian until she went to school. Right. Um, because that was what was spoken in the house. So I sort of call myself one and a half, um, generation Australian. So I'm sort of first generation on my dad's side and sort of second on my mum's. Um, so it, I sort of grew up in a community that was um, slightly separated from the Italian and Croatian community and that my mum and dad made a very conscious decision not to stay in the um, Swan Valley, which is where my mum was and where my dad one of the places he worked when he first came to Perth and they met in Midland. Um, and many of the people who come out with my dad and the people my mum grew up with actually married and stayed in the Swan Valley. But my parents uh, made the huge leap to Bassendine. Right. But in that, at that point, although Bassendine, you know, is quite close to the Swan Valley, it was really considered, um, it was really a much more suburban environment. So most of their friends stayed in the rural you know, semi-rural environment of the Swan Valley, lived on vineyards, et cetera. And, but my parents decided they wanted to live in the suburbs, albeit not that separated from it. And so um, instead of sort of having that sort of more rural lifestyle, we definitely had a suburban lifestyle, which was quite different to some of the families that we were close to. Um, and so we went to schools in sort of the local area and um, – very much had this expectation growing up that we were going to go to university, which I don't ever actually remember my parents saying that that was their expectation. It was just, just that. It was just there, given that my parents had had less time at school between the two of them by the time I left high school. So it was quite unusual. My dad had four years of school. My mum was forced to leave in year nine uh, or thereabouts, year eight, actually. I think it would have been the equivalent um, because of things that were happening in her family. So coming coming from a family with very little um, uh, sort of significant education or formal education, somehow my parents developed this um, sort of feeling that education was important and certainly set up an attitude at home that we all expected to go to university. So right. it was slightly different. I also have a slightly different experience in that um, my older sister, I'm one of three girls, um, middle child syndrome, um, but um, my older sister was diagnosed with a severe physical disability at the age of three. She had a form of muscular dystrophy, which caused severe um, physical disabilities for her. Um, incredibly brilliant woman, um, but her disease led to her early death at 34. 
Um, and so I had that experience of growing up in a family with someone with a severe disability. And just to go from the sublime to the ridiculous, my younger sister was an Olympic swimmer. Right. So right. <laughs> I was sandwiched between this brilliant um, but very physically um, disabled older sister who went on to do a PhD and became a world expert in sudden infant death syndrome, particularly in Indigenous populations. And then my younger sister, who's equally brilliant, um, but uh, really put a lot of effort in her younger years into her swimming and went to the Seoul Olympics. Amazing. Yes. So quite an unusual upbringing in a way. Yes. Um, given that my parents had no experience of any of this, you know, certainly not of the disability. And in those days, there was very little to be guided by. There weren't sort of the support groups and things that there are these days. And also, neither of them had been given the opportunity to to play much sport. My mum was very talented, but didn't have that opportunity. Um, and yet they sort of negotiated they, these two incredibly different fields of endeavour, if you like, um, yes. incredibly well. And I sort of, mm. I sort of describe myself as the one in the middle who sort of learnt to work out what everybody needed and then just do that right. and make sure that everybody was okay, which I think is partly why I ended up in medicine. Well, that was going to be one of my questions. Yeah. You left school. You went to UWA to go and study medicine. Well, I didn't actually. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. I didn't want to be a doctor. I did science at school and that's what I was, you know, it was sort of my forte. Um, I did a lot of things at school. I, I loved my high school life in particular. I went to Mercedes and it was just the best fit for me and I loved it. And I did, you know, totally into my sport but also into my studies and had a wonderful time. And um, I was very privileged and lucky that I sort of got to see most of Australia through my sport in my younger years through um, various representative teams, which was fantastic. I did a lot of track and field, a lot of netball. I did swim as well, but I wasn't anywhere near as talented as my sister Fiona. Um, but I, w I loved school and school was important to me. So while I was doing all this sport and studying, I was also doing public speaking and things and all that sort of stuff as well. Like I just loved all of it. Um, and so I actually went to uni. The one thing I didn't want to be was a doctor. And that was because... What was that? Yeah, well, in year eight, um, so my first year at Mercedes, I managed to cut my hand really badly at a sports session doing something really stupid. And to this day, I have a big scar. And I was taken up to Royal Perth Hospital because it's right next to Mercedes in town. And I think it was probably some poor, unfortunate intern who had to stitch up my hand. And because it was such a deep cut, it had gone through the muscle. And so they had to do this double layer closure and I stitched up the muscle. And by the time they got to the skin, all the local had worn off. And I basically just gritted my teeth through, I think it was 13 or 14 stitches with no anesthetic. And I just remember thinking, I am never going to do that to anybody. I do not want to be the person yeah. that causes that sort of pain on anybody. The one thing I don't want to be is a doctor. So that was year eight. So the, by the time I got to year 12 and science was my thing and I loved chemistry and physics and I really enjoyed biology, I decided I was going to be a dentist. Right. So I went to uni to be a dentist. Okay. And in those years, dentistry was a year of science and then you applied Whereas medicine, you went straight in as a as a, a school leaver, so it was an undergraduate course. And I started going to all the pre dental get togethers, and I just thought this isn't for me. I decided I wanted to be a pediatric dentist because every job I'd ever done was with children. But even so, I just kept going to these people who kept telling about what their career in dentistry was like, and I just thought you are not my people. Right. And what, what was that? Well, the one that really got me, the last one that put the nail in the coffin, was this man who I'm sure he thought he was doing and saying the right thing. But he stood up there and it was in, in the days of carousels and slides, because I'm that old, um, and he was clicking away on his slides and saying, this is my car, this is my other car, this is my boat, this is my house, this is my um, holiday house by the beach. And I just thought... I don't want to be in any profession that you're in. I am not doing dentistry so that I can get all the trappings. Right. This is not what it's about for me. You know, it's about helping people. And I is just that thought. Is at the core of Yeah. It? Well, it, I think it always was for me. Every job I'd done had either been teaching or helping in right. a way, you know. Where does that come from? Well, I think it comes from survivor guilt, really, to be perfectly honest. Survivor guilt? Yeah, well, I yeah. think when you're second in line to someone with a severe disability, you grow up with a particular experience and 
And, and, I th and I'm not saying it was just the experience. It's also clearly my underlying tendency personality-wise. But I felt that there was no reason for me to ever complain. Anytime I thought about complaining about my lot in life, I just had to look at the person sitting next to me at the dinner table and think, you've got nothing to complain about. And so helping people was very much part of what I did. You know, even in the family, I just mm. sort of picked up that I just did what was needed to make sure everybody was okay. And I think that was became my vocation really was to – make sure everybody was okay. And so I was doing dentistry <clears throat> to help people. That was my idea. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I almost actually, th then I thought, gee, what am I going to do? So I ended up actually putting in applications at the end of first year uni for medicine, dentistry and law um, because I wanted a profession. That was one thing I knew. My sister was um, sort of going down the science path and I could see that that was going to be tough, like you, you basically live on research funding, mm. which means you're always writing grants and asking for money. And I thought, no, I really want a profession. And also because I'd spent year, quite a long time, you know, a fair bit of my childhood, every school holidays working in my parents' businesses, which are always small businesses of every single variety you could possibly think of. Lots based in the food industry, but we did everything from, um, uh, taxi trucks. So, you know, removalist furniture, removalist businesses to, um, concrete businesses to, uh, fertilizer businesses, to anything yeah. you can think of. And from the time I was old enough, you know, I would work in the businesses in the holidays. And I just thought, no, this has got knobs on it. Yeah. <laughs> I want a profession. You know, I want somewhere where I know I can, um, I can do what I need to help people, but I can also earn money. Yeah. Um, and I think some of that comes from that first generation thing, that drive to want to do the best you can. So I am, um, and, and I think also the other thing that informs it a lot is that, you know, um, my family are Catholic and I'm a practicing Catholic and it's always been a very big part of my life. And so the whole idea of contrib contributing to society and making the world a better place has always been a big driver for me. Right. So I think that's possibly what really grated with me when this chap got up and just went, click, click, click through all of his toys. Yeah. And I just kept thinking, that's not what life's about. I'm not saying don't have fun, but, you know, it, it's a it, a big bit for me is about service. Mm. And I think that comes from, you know, my family uh, experience, but also the church experience is that, you know, we're here for a reason and it's to make the world the best place it possibly can be. And we all have... Um, we all have some part to play in that. That's just my philosophy in life. And so when this man just kept going on about the toys, I thought, no, nah, sure, I want a nice life. Um, yeah. You know, it's not that I don't want to earn money and enjoy myself. It's just that it's not all about that. Yes. That wouldn't have been, if you were standing up there, that wouldn't have been your lead. No, no, that certainly wouldn't have been my lead. No. no. And, and in fact, you know, when I talk to medical students now about medicine, I never talk about the money. You know, it, it, it it is a good job in terms of supporting your lifestyle. I'm not saying that. But if you don't want to help people, then don't it's get into it. It's going to be a tough day at the office. Yeah, hugely tough day. And, you know, for me, the most incredibly nurturing times of my career have been in the deepest, darkest depths of people's suffering. You know, it's the growth that you get from being with people. So that's personal growth. Personal growth that you get but also you know, the fact that you know that you're walking with them on this really difficult journey. But at the end, you always wonder whether it, you've gained more out of it than they have, you mm. know, because you just, it makes you grow and become a, a different and better person. And that's why I hope people will do medicine because of that amazing experience. There's nothing like it, that connection that you get with people at those incredibly difficult times of their lives. And for me, it's with the children as well as with the families, mm. or has been. Um, it, it is just so life affirming in a, even at, you know, for me doing children's cancer, even at the time of death, yeah. it is life affirming. And, it, and it's just yeah. an amazing experience. So I fell into medicine in a lot of ways. I applied for yeah. these three things. It was a long, complicated process, but I ended up getting a what they called a non-standard offer into medicine, which they only gave five back then. Right. <laughs> they, five people were allowed non-standard entry. So I went from first year science to second year medicine. Yeah. And every single day of the first three weeks, I wanted to give up. 
Right. Because there was 115 people who all knew each other from the year before <laughs> and then five of us who didn't know each other and who sat scattered around the lecture theatre waiting for all the other 115 to come in who were outside chatting and mucking around because they'd already had a very sort of, um, uh, you know, an experience where they had all bonded in the first year. And so every day I thought, no, I can't keep doing this. This is terrible. And then, you know, slowly you start to meet people and then I started to quite enjoy the studies. I mean, we did have some interesting lecturers back then who, who would say some very interesting things that also made me think maybe this isn't the place for me. But anyway, um, I started to really enjoy the the subject content and then um, I started meeting people and they were I was very blessed. I, I, I went through with a wonderful bunch of people. So um, I had, you know, had another five years of medicine that I really enjoyed. Awesome. Hmm. Awesome. So how did you get to the point of specialising in hmm. paediatric hematology, oncology? Well, I... Um, Yes, it's a long myself, process. Yeah. yeah, I myself have obviously not trained to be a doctor. Yes, yeah. So you, I, I understand you. You leave medical school. You leave medical school and then you have to go and yep. decide actually what you want Wanted to do. To, yeah. <laughs> so I had a bit of a hint um, from medical school. I was incredibly fortunate to meet <clears throat> a wonderful, wonderful man named Michael Willoughby who um, started the oncology unit at Princess Margaret Hospital in the mid-'80s. He came from the UK and was given the task of starting a unit when there was none. Some of the general paediatricians were looking after children with cancer at that stage, but there was no cancer unit as such. And I met him when I was in fifth year of medicine, um, which uh, was not that long after the unit was, had got up and running, actually. And he sort of rescued us from an interesting situation where we sort of bundled down to the ward and then found out we weren't supposed to, we weren't allowed to just go to the oncology ward and see patients. And mm. he came and grabbed us and took us to see patients, and he was so um, encouraging. And this, the, the children were just so impressive and just gorgeous and their parents that I just um, thought, wow, you know, this How is a pretty amazing place. Well, you know, these children who were going through extreme experiences. I'll never forget there was one girl I met who'd had uh, a leg amputation, and it really struck me because she was a state little athlete, which I had been. And, you know, she'd gone and represented WA and then had developed a tumour in a bone and had to have her leg amputated. And I'm just looking at this kid who was just getting on with it. You know, she was just, there was none of this, you know, reeling in self-pity. It was like, oh, well, I'm going to have to sort this out now. You know, and she was um, having chemotherapy and getting used to um, fittings for a prosthesis. And you just think, oh, my God, you know, this is life. Yeah. This is what it's really about. It's, it's reality some it's, people You know, it is not some of the stuff that goes on out there. It's certainly not social media. Yeah. Um, and so I was just, and, you know, and their parents who just sat there and were supportive and, you know, just their individual stories were incredibly impressive. And Michael Willoughby was just such a kind and gentle and clearly incredibly knowledgeable man. And as we were leaving, he just said, oh, you know, um, I think you all show great aptitude for this area. And, of course, he was talking to all of us, and I'm sure he said it to anybody who who managed to find them, their way down there. But I just took that on board and thought, oh, he thinks, you know, maybe I could do this. And uh, and so it was always something I had in the back of my mind. When I left um, medic uh, medical school, I was thinking about paediatrics or psychiatry. And then in my intern year, so your intern year is a year of general training. You're actually not fully registered. You have conditional registration until you finish your 50 weeks of your intern year. Yeah. Uh, and you do a bit of everything. And, and I did do psychiatry. And although I really enjoyed sort of the medicine of it, there was a lot of um, repeat um, admissions. And I just thought this would get soul destroying in the end. You did everything mm. you could to prop people up and you'd think you'd got them to a state where they would cope with their lives outside of the hospital and then they come back. And I only did 10 weeks. And there were some people who came back three or four times in right. those 10 weeks. And I just thought, oh, I think after a while I just feel like I I really wasn't making any difference. Yes. And I did have this feel that I needed to make a difference. Right. So that sort of put the kibosh on psychiatry. And then I got the opportunity. I applied to go to Princess Margaret in the first year, which a post-intern year, which back then you didn't really do. 
but I was very fortunate and I got a position at PMH at least to start the year. And there were two from my, uh, another chap and I both got positions there and I just loved it. From the minute I got there, I loved it. Um, and I never left. Right. So all of my work in Perth, except for going to the UK to do some training and then having some time off, and my time in um, Vancouver where I was training to come back to PMH, um, really from 1990 when I started there, I didn't stop except for training elsewhere until the um, beginning of this year. Right. Hmm. All right. So talk me through what's the average day, week like? In your role. Right. So I'm not, I have to own up here because I'm not a paediatric haematologist oncologist anymore. Well, That's not what I'm doing. During that time. But during that time. What's so the average day? So it life? was very variable um, and it depended. We The job was sort of broken up into looking after the ward and then looking after the outpatients. And so when you're on ward, um, supervising the ward as the consultant, you have junior medical staff who are working with you. And they tend to do um, a lot of the grunt work, but all the responsibility still lies with the consultant, right. which um, which means on a ward like um, paediatric hemonc, you know, a cancer ward, you have to keep your finger on the pulse. You can't just let the junior staff go and not know what they're doing <laughs> at any particular point in time because it's really complex and complicated. So you'll have a mix of children in having um, their planned chemotherapy um, who are doing fine and not getting any side effects. You'll have other children who are having their planned chemotherapy who are falling apart in every single way that you wouldn't expect, who, who get very, very unwell. You'll have children who are in, who have come in after their chemotherapy um, because all their blood cells are very low, particularly their white cells, and they have a nasty infection. So they'll come in with fever and a terrible infection. You'll have children who are undergoing bone marrow transplants. And then you can also have children who have non-malignant problems in as well, so bleeding problems and those sorts yeah. of problems. So you have this really interesting mix at any particular point in time. And basically, <laughs> I used to say that it was a bit like being a fireman. You just went around all day putting out the fires because there would be problems left, right and centre and you were just working with the junior staff to make sure you're keeping the patients as well as you possibly can within the constraints yeah. of their therapy and their disease. Yeah. So a lot of thinking on your feet, a lot of talking to people, a lot of um, really needing to connect with parents because in the midst of all of this you would then get new diagnoses, so children who are coming in for the first time, yeah. you know, who their parents find they have a fever or a slight rash or or a lump in their neck or, or something very innocuous who go to their GP or come into the emergency department and have no idea that their child has cancer yeah. and then within the space of a few hours they meet me. Yeah. Not a great thing to do, you know. And uh, and so then in between all that other workload you have to balance the new new families and the new diagnoses and going up to the emergency department or meeting them on other wards because they've been admitted under other units um, but it turns out they have cancer and then you, you meet them. And so there's a lot of time in that initial meeting getting to know the family. Is it like breaking that news to a family? It is never the same. Each time is different. Um, it's one of the most challenging but also most enriching but potentially most disastrous things that you do as a, a children's cancer specialist um, because... Children and, uh, are treated for their cancers for a very long time compared to adults. So just to give you the background, yeah. um, in this day and age, 85% of children with cancer will survive and go on to live relatively normal lives. Unfortunately, as there are more and more long-term survivors, and I'm meaning 40 and 50 years out, we are learning that their lives actually aren't completely normal because the therapy they've had um, leaves them with physical disabilities or, or organ dysfunction that we weren't expecting. Yep. Um, so you think about it, in the 1960s, no children with cancer were, were cured, um, and that includes, includes acute leukaemia, which is the most common diagnosis so in children. Like 100% Everybody died. Uh, so, And then you think about it now, in 2017, 95% of kids with standard risk acute leukaemia survive their disease. So we have made a huge improvement in a very short period of time. Hmm. So there is an exponential growth in survivors 
but we still we didn't have a critical mass to know what happens 20 years down the track when we were curing nobody in the 60s and very few in the 70s, few more in the 80s, really starting to get some leeway in the 90s. That's when we really started to, you know, late 80s, early 90s is when the cure rates really started to go up. So those people, if, you know, if they were young when they were diagnosed, they are still only 30 years out. Yes. When you think about it. Yes. So we didn't know then and we still don't know now the way we've changed our therapies, what will happen in 40 and 50 years' time. Yeah. So when I say they survive with what we consider to be a normal life, it's certainly normal for most of their childhood yes. and till they get into employment, et cetera, et cetera. Whether it's normal beyond there or not, the jury's still out. Yes. Yeah. So 85% cure rate, pretty damn good. Most of them don't have severe dis disabilities. Some of them do of mm. those, particularly our 20% of children who have brain tumours because if they've been treated with radiation, then they will have um, certainly learning disabilities at best and intellectual, intellectual disabilities of varying mm. degrees at worst. Um, so you know that when you go to meet a family, sometimes you have a fair idea what the diagnosis is. Sometimes you don't. Mm. And so if you do have a fair idea of what the diagnosis is, you're always hoping for the best. Yes. You sort of plan for the worst, hope for the best. Um, and you tend to, to, to pitch things towards the best side of things when you go. You learn over the time that you do have to prepare yourself for that news because the, the one thing is that becomes very obvious very early or even when you're training is that from the moment you tell a family their child has cancer, their lives are changed forever. Nothing is ever the same. Mm. It doesn't matter if they are cured and go on to live a completely normal life afterwards. For the family and the parents in particular, there is life before cancer and life after cancer. Yeah. And even if they go on to live a normal life, it's a new normal. It is not the old normal yeah. because they will never be that carefree family that they were because yeah. there is always that specter of of cancer in their minds and the trauma that they went through. Yes. Even though our job is to make it as traumaless as possible. Mm. You can't. You it. can't. You can't. And so you're very aware that they will never forget what you say. Mm. And I learnt that from the stories from my mum when my sister was diagnosed with her disability. Yes. My sister was diagnosed in uh, 1967. So my sister was, uh, was it 67? Yeah, it must have been 67 because I think my mum was about to have my younger sister. So she was three and a half-ish. I was one and a bit and my mum was pregnant with my younger sister. So it was either 66 or 67. Um, and my mum can tell you to this day what she remembers and she remembers it as clear as, as if it was yesterday. Mm. Now, whether it's exactly what the doctor said or not, I can't tell because I was too young to know, even though I was there. But I suspect it's pretty close mm. to what they said, you know, in 1967. So I knew that. I, I, I had that awareness yes. of what it's like for a family to go through sort of a tragic diagnosis, even though I'd never really discussed it with my mum in that way. Right. But I had a, an experience of it. And so it's always been, for me, I, it's always been really important that you try and make it as least traumatic as possible. So A, because they'll carry with it for the rest of their lives. B, because their lives are changing forever yeah. from that moment forward. And C, because you have to develop a relationship with this family that is long lasting and that becomes very effective therapeutically. Yeah. Because if you don't, then their child will not do well. Yes. If you aren't able to work very closely with this family, then their child suffers. And that's the last thing that you want because everything's about the child. Yes. And so there's all of these reasons to take that first meeting very, very seriously. And so you do prepare yourself. You try and get yourself into a headspace of getting some information about the family as much as you can. Sometimes you get very little, sometimes you get a little bit more, um, as much information as you can about what might be going on with the child, um, about the tests they've had and what the diagnosis might be. Um, and then you have to do some of the other groundwork sort of on the spot, which is who's there with them, do they have any support people? Who can be there to support them? Who can be there to support the child? Because if they need to listen to you, then it's very hard for them to comfort the child, depending on what age the child is. If they're a teenager, do you want to have the conversation with the teenager in the room or not? How much do you want to talk to the teenager right there and then when you're still breaking the news to the family? So there's all these things that you start thinking about. Who do you want in the room? 
And if it's during the day, it's great because you have a bit of a choice. If it's in the middle of the night, which it not infrequently is, (laughs) you don't have much choice. I always want to take someone because the fact is that um, the parents will remember very little of what I say on that first meeting. I get that. Um, From the moment I say the C word, you know, don't hear a lot more. Yeah. Um, And so you want someone there who is going to be there for the next couple of hours if I'm not, if I'm organising stuff, yes. um, to answer their questions um, and let me know what it is I need to go back in and talk about that they yeah, haven't heard. That. And so it's very easy if we have these wonderful oncology liaison nurses at PMH who would be your first choice to take with you because that's what they do all the time and they yeah. provide family support. But at night it's often one of the members of the junior staff from the emergency department or it's a nurse from the emergency department or it's someone who's developed some bond with the family since they've arrived. Um, And so you just have to pick someone who you think will be able to sit through it. Yep. And that's quite difficult sometimes because it's really hard for people to sit through uh, a conversation about a child's diagnosis with cancer. And people don't know how they're going to react to it until they've been there. So then you get a bit of a plan in your head about how you're going to do it and where you might do it. If the emergency department, you think about what rooms might be available and where you might be able to sit and you try and set it up so that there's someone with the the mum or dad or at least that they're together. If there's a grandparent, great. Um, you need to get someone to watch the child because it's often easier to take them away from the room to have that first conversation um, unless they're a real baby because once the parents start getting upset, the kids start getting upset and then it gets very difficult. Yes. And so I usually go in and I would meet the family. I'd often take a history and examine um uh, the patient, um, whoever they uh, were, depending on their age, and just um, if someone hasn't already examined them, then I do a complete examination. But if one of the junior staff have, then I'll just pick out the things that are important for me. And in fact, that ritual of examining patients in that situations is is really important. Mm. Um, and it's one of the things I'm very passionate about in medicine is that the ritual of touch is really important in developing relationships, um, and particularly in the medical setting. So as the sooner a child gets used to the idea that people will come and that the touch is to care for them is really important. Yes. So I will often, even if I don't absolutely need to, I'll examine some part of the child on that very first meeting so they know that's my job and that that's part of what I do. Yeah, exactly. Um, And then I will usually take the parents to a separate room and – Hopefully, with a you know a group of people to support them and and to be there to answer their questions, um, if and when I need to go off and do things. Um, and then, doesn't matter how much you've planned it, it never goes to plan. <laughs> so you always have this plan in your head about how you're going to start it and where you're going to go to, and and it almost never works that way. And and that's good actually. I think you do need a plan because you don't want to miss anything out. So you need to prepare yourself mentally, but then you really have to be in the moment. Because if you're not in the moment taking the cues from the family, mm. it won't go well. So if you just want to run it to your own script, it's not going to be a good experience for Correct. the family. Mm-hmm. So you really have to follow where they're at. And, you know, you get everything from completely the people who absolutely stop breathing, where you literally have to stop talking and just remind them to breathe, to the people who scream and run out of the room, to the people who collapse on the floor, to the people who start hitting their head against a wall. I mean, like you just get every single possible reaction you can think of Mm. and you have to be prepared for it and you have to know, have some idea how to comfort them in that moment. And so you have to change what you're doing. You just have to be there. I mean, I think that's the thing is that you just, it's an exercise in mindfulness. Yes. You know, like you just totally have to be in the moment and you have to be your extreme presence. And, and really can, trying to connect as much as you can to their emotions because you need to pick up on where they're at so that you can comfort them in the most appropriate way possible. As well as still guide them through what Exactly, like. exactly. So then you have to start the, you have to give some information, you know, because you have to give them, You can't just say your child's got cancer, wait for everything to fall apart and then walk out. (laughs) You know, you have to give them information that they can take on board about what's going to happen next and what they're going to see, do, 
perhaps you, feel experienced. Are you, are you needing to seek decisions from them at this point? So because that must be quite tricky. Yeah. So usually, um, usually not immediately. Although I, I say usually because one of the things about medicine is you never say never and never say always <laughs> um, because there are times where it is so of the moment that you have to get on and do things right here and now. Yeah. And I've certainly found myself in that situation where you have to give the diagnosis and say, look, I'm really sorry, yeah. but we need to make decisions right now. I know that's crippling for you, but we need to find a way that we can make a decision about this because your child is really sick, yes. you know, and I'll come back and tell you everything I need to you know, a thousand times over, however often I need to, but right now we need to make some decision. Um, but, um, but fortunately that isn't the usual. Usually you have a little bit of time to at least settle them in. Yes, you have to tell them they're going to a cancer ward, so you have to warn them about children with no hair and with tubes in their noses and, you know, all these sorts of things that, that they have no concept of or any idea that they were ever going to end up in. You have to talk about putting in drips to give fluids and taking bloods off and, you know, all those practical things that you need to do. Even if it's midnight, you still have to talk about those things because you've got to get the child well enough for anything you need to do in the morning. With leukaemia being the commonest diagnosis, you um, we need to do the definitive procedure, which is usually a bone marrow test. We have to take a sample from the bone marrow, which is usually from the pelvic bone that we take it. And so that means generally the next morning the child will have a general anaesthetic. So we have to talk about fasting and we have to talk about what the bone marrow will be like. Yes, we're going to revisit it in the morning, but the lists start early and you've got to give them time to think about it before you go to get the consent the next morning, for example. And with that comes consents about treatment. Because one of the things that has changed the zero survivors from the 1960s to 95% for acute ALL these days and has been for the ALL last few years, mean. acute lymphoblastic leukaemia, yep. that's the commonest form of leukaemia in children, is our complete commitment to a very scientific way of treating children with cancer and that's on multinational, very large clinical trials. And so because we treat children on clinical trials, we have to talk about that concept to parents very early uh, because, if, for example, if their child has acute leukaemia and is going to have a bone marrow, the morning after I've told them that their child has this incredibly nasty disease, we need to ask if we can take samples to send off to our study centre in the States to see if they're eligible to be on a clinical trial. And if we don't get their consent before they go to, to um, theatre to have the studies done, then they cannot be on any available clinical trial. And you may say, well, so what? But the fact is we know that kids on clinical trials do better than kids who aren't. Right. <laughs> and actually getting some of that information, we can't get any other way than through being on a clinical trial. So it actually is in the child's best interests to at least get that sample sent off and get it to um, America and the other places that we send them around Australia for the specific tests. But trying to get that across, as you can imagine, if the child's been diagnosed at midnight and then at 8 o'clock in the morning you've moved on from the your child has leukaemia discussion to where go you remember we talked about going to theatre this morning yeah. and now we have to talk a bit more about what I started suggesting to you last night which was about the clinical trial. I mean, you know, it is a nightmare for the families. You can't even imagine what a nightmare it is. You just created a brand new reality for Exactly. <laughs> you know, so it's a very tricky um, path to walk, incredibly tricky, and you just have to be so sensitive to what's happening for them but at the same time holding very closely what's most important for the child, which is actually to get these tests done so that we know exactly what we're dealing with so we can get the treatment started as soon as possible. So... You think about a teenager, then there's another complicating layer altogether because you then have to talk to them about what's happening and how that's all going to work and how we need to have them on board and what decisions they may or may not be able to make and how all of a sudden there's going to be this whole group of baddies at the hospital who are going to be controlling their lives because, in fact, we're not controlling the lives. The cancer's controlling their lives. And because of that, we have to pull back on all of that wonderful independence they were just developing. And, you know, so then there's that whole complicated series of dynamics. conversations and dynamics that have to happen around that. So it's sort of endlessly um, uh, complicated. You know, there 
you, there's every connotation that can happen and you never know before you walk into that room and pull the um, curtain across or open the door to meet the family which way it's going to go. And so you actually have to be prepared for everything mm. and the only way to do that is to be completely in the moment. What did you learn about yourself through this? Oh, you learn a lot of things about yourself and about people um, and about suffering <laughs> and uh, how much you can give of yourself while still protecting yourself. Um, because one of the things that you really have to be very careful of is every child who's diagnosed with cancer is a tragedy. But you have to be careful to recognise that it's their tragedy and their family's tragedy and you cannot take the tragedy on as yours, otherwise you won't be able to function um, effectively as their doctor. At the same time, you have to really be able to key into their emotions and really have that empathy. And so it's trying to get that balance right. And, you know, for a while I used to really wonder about, um, you know, crying with families and whether that was a good, bad or otherwise thing. And in the end I gave up, gave up worrying about it because there's some days that you just can't stop yourself crying mm. with a new family or an old family, you know, one of your families, whoever it is, where it just gets to that point that for whatever reason, whether it's where you're at or whether it's where the child is at and the family is at or a combination of both, you just do. <laughs> and, and, and I stopped worrying about, you know, if that was okay yeah. because I figured as long as I didn't, you know, take over the encounter by making it all about me because that's the last thing I want, yeah. if there's something genuine going on there that needs to be expressed, then I can't stop it either because that's part of my humanity. Yes. So I think what it is, it's about being real. And, and I, and I think it, for me, um, what I learned is it's, it's, they are the most human experiences. You know, deeply connecting with people who are suffering is the most human experience. You know, I think it really is our essence. It's what we're made for is to develop those incredibly intimate experiences through that, that intimate connection with people. Now, for most people, that happens with their family and their loved ones. I've had the enormous privilege of being able to do that with people who I have an entirely different relationship with. Yes. And I'm not saying there isn't love there because I think there is love. I think the care becomes love. It's just a totally different sort of love yes. from my perspective. Yeah. Um, but being able to connect with people on that level is so nourishing as a human being. Like it, it really is extraordinary. Yeah. Um, and I and I think that it's quite hard to describe. Um, I can imagine that, this is the thing that's coming up for me at the moment, Liz, to you. At that moment, everything, everything, you know, social media, phones, jobs, everything is stripped away. And totally. Only, and only the most important thing. Exactly. For children is at that point. Exactly. Child, yeah. And so it's that real pure humanness of this is what life is about. I think that's what it is for me, is it teaches you what really when everything's stripped away, what life is about. It is about those moments of deep connection and 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 sometimes deep suffering, but also because of that. the suffering almost needs to be the gateway to, to that. To that, but also be, sometimes through that deep suffering there's also deep joy. You know, there can be moments that are so transcendent and I'll probably start crying if, um, talking about this, but the one that has been the most um, probably transcendent for me was a gorgeous little girl who we'd looked after for a long time on the unit who'd had a bone marrow transplant for a form, a different form of leukaemia and who had got through the transplant and we used to call her the dancing queen because she would get up on her bed and be bopping away at two and three in the morning and just wouldn't go to sleep, you know, this four-year-old. And her, her mother is just the most divine woman you'd ever meet, gentle and kind and beautiful. And she would just be sitting there <laughs> while her daughter would just be bopping away on the bed at four in the morning just wanting to get some sleep, but it wasn't going to happen. And an incredible, um, I'd have to say chutzpah, this, this little girl. Like she didn't want to do anything. She didn't want to do something. There was no way you were getting her to do it. Yeah. And so you'd have this incredible um, 
sort of challenge with her. If you needed to get her to a certain point, she didn't want to do it. It was hilarious. But, um, you know, and you would just sometimes you would just have to go, okay, I have to find another way. Like I really need to do this for her health. And for her it was often about looking in her mouth. And post-transplant it's really important to assess the mouth because they get all of this breakdown of their skin in their mouth and we need to keep assessing it. We need to keep doing topical treatments and this sort of stuff. And she just wouldn't let you look in her mouth. You know, and you were just like, oh, I want to strangle her right now, you know, because all she had to do was open her mouth. But nope, that was going to be her control thing. And, you know, so the tussles would go on and, you know, it'd be a weekend and you'd been there all week and you really just wanted to go home and she wouldn't let you look in your ma- in her mouth and you're thinking, what am I going to do now? And so there'd be these hilarious tussles. Anyway, she was just the most amazing um, child. So she, um, she got out of hospital, was doing quite well, and then I saw her in clinic and she just wasn't right. And she just had dropped off with her eating. She wasn't hungry. She just lost a little bit of weight. And there was just something about her that felt wrong to me. And I couldn't completely put my finger on it, but, you know, when you've done it for a long time, you just know, intuition. yeah, your intuition is this isn't right. So I actually um, I admitted her to hospital with, without really good cause except I wanted to investigate why she had started to lose weight. Well, within a few days, she um, had developed terrible respiratory problems and was in the intensive care unit. And when you're post-transplant and you have terrible respiratory problems, it is a very bad place to be. And her parents were so brave about the limits of what treatment they thought they could, she could tolerate and that they could tolerate for her. They, were, they had a deep faith and they just thought they they thought it through and thought no this is where our limits are and so they were happy for her to have a certain amount of respiratory support but not to go to the nth degree and um I went up to see her and she was really struggling and I could tell that there was there wasn't much time left for her and she she had a big mask on and this machine was breathing and she was uncomfortable and she was sort of moving her head and 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 I just said to her do you want a cloth darling and and she sort of went so I went to the sink and I got a flannel and you know I wet it and I put it on her head and she sort of tried to smile as much as she could with all this stuff happening and connected to a billion things and 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 um and she seemed a little more settled for a little while and then um she sort of motioned like this and I thought she wanted her dad who who was there. So I sort of looked at him and he went to her and he leant down near her and he said, no, she wants you. And so I went and let, leant near her and she just gave me this hug. This is a, a little girl who had bit, well, really didn't have the energy to breathe. Mm-hmm. You know, she was so, you know, every fibre in her being was trying to keep her alive and She wanted me to lie down next to her on the bed so she could give me a hug. And she gave me this hug and she patted me and, you know, my heart was breaking and as I was sitting, you know, there with her and then she sort of gently let go and I stood back up and I just said to her, you know, what a brave girl she was and how much we loved, everybody on the ward loved her and how much we care about her and that we... um you know, we don't want her to be in any pain and we just want to look after her. And and um, and she was holding my hand and then she let it go. So I stepped back and I stood for a little bit longer and then I realised that the, the um, flannel had got a bit um, dry again. So I went and put it back in. I put it back down and stood back again for a bit and I was talking to her mum and dad. And then she went like this again and her dad says, she wants you. <laughs> And I said, okay. And I leant back again and, and put my arms out. And she, um, she hugged me this time and she started stroking my hair. And I just, you know, I could feel her spirit. Yeah. You know, I, like I, I've never felt a human being like that. I could just feel who she was. You know, it was just, and I could just feel that she was saying, it's okay. I know you've done your best. You know, there was just this transmission of this love from her to me and, to, you know, to, through me to the whole of the unit that I just, you know, you know, so, of course, I'm crying. She's stroking my hair. <laughs> she can barely breathe. And and she just held me, you know, and I, it was just the most beautiful 
transcendent experience that you could ever imagine. And eventually she let me go and I just said to her, you know, how much we all loved her again and that, um, you know, I, w- I will go down and tell everybody how much that she loves them um, because ICU is upstairs from the oncology unit. And I said my goodbyes and said that, you know, again, what a brave girl I was and that whatever she needed to to do, we knew that it was the right thing and that none of us felt let down and that um, and that we just loved her. And and I left and, you know, about 15 minutes later she died. And, you know, you just, that is, you know, this is a young child who was of no genetic <laughs> mm. relationship to me, but I had one of the most significant bonds I've had with, with anybody in the world. Mm. And so that's what doing this job can do. <laughs> yeah. You know, at its ultimate, that is, uh, and, and, you know, and that is why it's such a privilege to be with people um, and children in that sort of space. It's life and death, unfortunately. Mm. Mm. Well, uh, how do you, you, you obviously, you know, as we talk about it now, you can reflect on it and, and talk about it quite articulately. Were you able to do that during your time? Yes. Yeah, I think... Um, for me, um, it was such a difficult but joyful experience in a way. And, and look, I think I, I think part of dealing with these sorts of um, very deeply emotional um, experiences is talking about them, actually make sense of them. Hmm. And so I am the sort of person who thinks through and talks through things to make sense of them. Um, I do think, and, and this became obvious to me um, a couple of years ago, that as much as that nourishes you, there is a side to being exposed to other people's suffering that is can be quite um, detrimental to your own health over time. Um, I did pretty much full-time oncology for mm. almost 20 years with kids and you know that's a lot of time to be marinating in other people's suffering hmm. um and what did you do to keep yourself well the, yeah that's and- a very good very good question so i found you know my dad died when um i was still training and in fact my dad and my sister died within nine months of each other and i, I discovered through that time that i hadn't actually appreciated before that i could sit with people who who were dying and I can sit with people who are suffering and I don't need to say anything. I can just sit. Mm. I can be in that very uncomfortable space mm. with them and just sit with them until they're ready to talk. And sometimes in those first meetings with families, there's a lot of silence mm. while they're just trying to come to terms with what I've said. And and I can do that. And I, and I realised that not everybody can. It was actually when my dad died I realised realize that not everybody in my family could. Mm. And that doesn't make them good or bad people. No. It just means we have different abilities to do things. And I suppose that's partly why oncology was a good fit for me, is that I can sit with people who are suffering and just sit with it. Um, on the other hand, I think there is a point where your suffering silo becomes full. Yeah. And it can be really difficult to drain it out, you know, to empty it out a bit. And, in fact, I discovered yoga and mindfulness about 10 years in when I realised that my suffering silo was getting a bit full. Yeah. I just felt that I felt like I was getting a bit grumpy and I'm not a grumpy person generally. Um, I'm, you know, very much a a glass half full sort of person. And, in fact, when I talked to people, people at work hadn't noticed it yet, but I'd noticed that things were getting to me that usually wouldn't. And I was just getting more tetchy. And, yes, I was tired. You know, the work's hard. It's long hours. It's it's emotionally draining. And I'd been working pretty hard and I was getting tired. Um, and that's when I went back to yoga. I tried many years before and I never clicked with it. I just couldn't tolerate people talking about this pose is good for your right ovary. I just wanted to smack them. Um, you know, because you come from this very biological science background and you just don't want to, you just think, oh, please. You know, just just let me stretch. Forget the mumbo jumbo. Anyway, I almost didn't go back to it, even you know, at that ten year mark, because I went to a class 
where the teacher was so inappropriate for a beginner's class that I thought, right, this just confirms everything I thought about yoga. It's just terrible. She basically said to us, it was a beginner's and pregnancy class on a Saturday afternoon and someone had recommended I go to this place, so I did. And uh, she said, all right, I'll get into Downward Dog. And this is about the second or third thing we did. So we got into Downward Dog and she went, oh, I'm going to have to put you in the straps to the whole class. Right. It was like, really? This is a yoga class. Aren't we all meant to be at the level we are? <laughs> it's a beginner's class and half of these women have babies about to pop. You know, don't go, oh. Like I really, it just totally did my head in. Anyway, so I thought, oh, maybe this is not for me. And then some friends had started a beginner's course somewhere else. And they said, look, come along, come along. I said, but don't you have to do the whole course? They said, no, no, it'll be fine. You know, we've got this great teacher. He won't mind if you come along. And he was divine. And he was just, he said all the right things. And I went, okay, I maybe I can do this. You know, he said those sort of things like, you know what, even if you can't do poses now, and let's face it, you know, you're beginning. And, you know, even for me, he's been doing it for, year, for years. There's lots of poses I can't do. But, you know, as long as you don't get injured, if you keep practicing, one day you'll be able to do them. I'm like, that's what I want to hear in a yoga class, not yeah. this, oh, I'm going to have to put you in the ropes. Yeah. <laughs> so I got into it. And, um, and in fact, I, I stayed at that studio and I still go there, um, order the teachers from that studio, wherever they may be. Um, so, and so it really this, helped. What was this giving you? Did you notice you were getting a bit touchy? So it just gave me some space to stop all of the thought. Right. You know, like I, I have, my brain goes at a million miles a minute, which is really useful when you're putting out fires all the time, an oncology yes. ward. Like, you know, I get that. As, as one gorgeous yoga teacher said to me, who teaches somewhere else but who is, is just amazing, she always says to me, how's that pushy little brain of yours going? <laughs> <laughs> And she says, I acknowledge that it's been very good for you, but it, sometimes it doesn't serve you. And she's absolutely right. So this pushy little brain of mine that... It's your gift and your curse. And exactly. So it's the light and dark of your talents. Um, I, I was just, you know, I wasn't really sleeping because my brain was just going over. And I'm a real, I have a very vivid visual memory. I can picture most of the family's diagnosis um, chat of all the kids I've diagnosed. Right. I know where I was, where they were, which room it was, whether it was in Vancouver or Perth, who was where, who was in the room, what the emotions were. Like I have a visual record of and this almost, is, what, several hundred. Who that knows, over 20 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, which is also good and bad because that is a great setup for post-traumatic stress disorder yep. <laughs> to have such a strong visual memory, as you know. Um and so what I found, the yoga just gave me this space where my brain on the good days would just stop for a while and I would really just get into the flow of that meditation in motion. There was some, I got into the habit and when I was really into it and doing very well where I would go, say, two or three mornings a week and like I exercise quite a lot, exercise one of the other great things I love to do and so I'd been doing early morning exercises class for years before this um, same time in the morning, like, you know, quarter to six or six o'clock. And I would love it because I see my friends, but I never got that bliss that I would get reasonably regularly at those early morning yoga classes. I would just leave the class floating. And it was just that brain stopping and just really being into what I was doing. And so it really was an exercise in, in very mindful movement. Right. And so it really helped for quite some time. And then I became head of department <laughs> <laughs> and it all went to heck in a handbasket. Right. <laughs> because not only was I dealing with all of the families and all of those issues, I was then had taken on a pretty large unit with a lot of FTE when you counted everybody up um, and lots of issues and lots of institutional issues and a whole lot of stuff. And in the end, it actually broke me. Right. It took three years, but, you know. Took three years. Of being head of department, yeah, but. Three years and a couple of terrible court cases and court appearances. And it was a 2014 was my Annus Horribilis. Hmm. And what did break you look like? Oh, well, it basically um, an anxiety disorder to start with, sort of. You know, I had chest tightness and, um, you know, churned tummy and, and just felt really 
all over the shop. But in fact, um, and extreme fatigue, actually, all of a sudden, because I'd probably been getting three or four hours sleep a night for much of that year, uh, which isn't enough for me. I'm not no. one of these people who can survive on three or four hours. I really can't. Um, but I was because my brain was going 24 hours a day and, you know, I'd be at home and I'd be emailing at 11 o'clock at night and, you know, there'd just be, it was endless. The work was endless and I couldn't manage it. And I was really worried about things that were happening on the unit and it was just constant concern that something was going to go wrong. And, um, and so when it happened, it started with chest pain and um, palpitations um, and then just this extreme um, exhaustion and pretty much like I was coming down with the flu, like I felt like I was viral. Mm. But the, the exhaustion to the extent that I couldn't, I could barely get off the chair. And then the other thing was this, this inability to, to, you know, this need to, my, when people came to me with problems, I either wanted to scream at them or cry. Like I only had two emotions left. That's all I really want to show. It took every fibre of my being not to do one of those two things. Yeah. So it took every fibre of my being to get off the chair and every fibre of my being not to scream or cry. So that's what it was like for me. So how, how is it, you know, you, you've got extreme fatigue, tight chest, et cetera, yet you also have the skills in theory to diagnose yourself. How does that play out? Well, Would you just stick it to one side and have this nice No, I knew. Spot? I knew. No, no. I went to my bosses. I told them what was happening. I couldn't leave work. Like it was, too, that was just too overwhelming for me. I, tr I told all Is that the story them, you're telling yourself? You can't leave. Work. That's the story I was telling myself. Yep. I, um, I told my colleagues, my consultant colleagues, what was happening and that I needed some space. Um, and then I had holidays coming up. I said, I'm going to try and make it through to my holidays and then, you know, try and really de stress over the holidays. After the holidays, I'm going to try and make it through to the end of our roster, which was the end of the January. And um, and then I'm going to pull back. I'm going to cut my hours. So that was the plan. So it was like a three-month plan. I got to my holidays, came back, and a couple of weeks later I got another hit with another court case. And I went to this court case, which wasn't about my medical care, and it was very bizarre. But anyway, I couldn't prepare for it properly for various reasons and there wasn't a lot of support. And then I got slammed on the, the stand for three hours, and this is now in December. And I couldn't go back to work. I just thought, I, I can't. I can't do anything, actually. Can't think. Can't do anything. I'm done. I'm done. And I, I, um, I went back to work the next day because we had a very special visitor coming around the ward. I won't say, but um, a very special visitor. And so I took them all around the ward. They had no idea there was anything wrong with me. But I'd made an appointment to see um, a management coach who was also a, a psychologist who um, – I had been seeing, but it got so busy I'd even stopped seeing her. <laughs> and she was the when one. when you need it most, that's when you of switch course, stuff off. Of course, when you switch stuff off. And she made me see um, by some very, very uh, carefully worded um, statements that I needed to leave work. So I went back to work that day because I, I had stuff planned, but I went to see my boss and said, I'm not coming back tomorrow, and I didn't. And that was the really awful part. Because as awful as it was to have all these symptoms, not going to work was the pits. Because after 20 years of being there, where does, where does Angela and where does the doctor? Who is and she? the sense of identity between the two. I mean, it was the guilt. It was the shame. It was the who the heck am I? It was the how can I do this to my colleagues and my patients? You know, it was just not going to work, particularly those first few days, I thought I was going to be crushed by it. Like I literally thought I bet, you know, I basically lay on the floor and just felt like I was being crushed. You know, like I could, I was doing things sort of moving and things, but you know, really I just, it was this overwhelming weight of guilt and shame and disappointment and loss of sense of self. It was just awful. It was absolutely awful. I mean, I just, my, my major visual image of that time, and it's hilarious because it sort of comes from an, um, an ab fab episode where Patsy had had so much liposuction that she'd become like this balloon. They were sucking everything out of her and she was just this skeleton of a balloon left with huge lips because they pumped up her lips but sucked out everything else of her. And, and so that was my image of, of 
me lying on the floor with everything sucked out of me and I was just sort of this balloon thing. Mm. And that, that's all I could see. And I couldn't see any way of be, becoming reinflated. So it was a pretty bad place to be for a while. How's that going for? Well, it's a good question. Um, it took me a long time to, to, to sort of on the inside a long time, on the outside not so long, you know, like because I, I sort of reverted to the doing because that's what I do. do. And so I did take I did take a good chunk off work, um, but then I needed to do something. Like I felt like my rec- – for you my recovery, I needed to. Well, I, I was seeing, you know, I was seeing people, and you know, I was being very careful about that, and I was doing all my yoga, and I was doing a lot of mindfulness stuff, and so I wasn't ignoring all of that. But I went back to part-time non-clinical work pretty quickly, actually, in a way, and then I developed this plan of professional development because I had all this professional development leave that I worked out with the hospital that I would do, as well as working on some hospital projects. So I started that up, you know, reasonably quickly. I think I had 10 weeks and then I was sort of back into things. I didn't see patients for 15 months. Um, partly it should have been more like 12, but there were issues with um, how it was being sorted, institutional issues rather than mine about how I got back. But um, but I got pretty busy. And in that time I also um, started my work at uh, Notre Dame. <laughs> so, you know, the irony of it, here I, you know, passionate about the well physician program, about the unwellest physician you're going to meet. Yes. But certainly had the insight to, mm. to say to students, you really need to look after your health, which is really what I saw my role as in that first year. Um, because, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty resilient person. I still, And that was one of the problems. Mm. One of the things was that I'd always seen myself as a resilient person. You know, I'd had taken a fair few hits in life and growing up with a sister with a severe disability, you know, like, you're used to the bumps and scratches, you know what I mean? Mm. Like you, you do the ups and downs and I'd be. One of the things that I'm thinking here is earlier you were saying you have this um, almost almost like this repeating record player in your head that says, oh, you'll be all right because look at the yes. person next to you yes. at the dinner table. Life can't be that difficult. But then at the same time, you've taken on enough of your own yes. shit. Yes, yes. Um, that you've got to cut yourself some slack. Yes. And it might not be like your older sister, but it's, but your, it's own your own and I'm very good at not doing that. So, you know, I'd been through a really difficult marriage breakup. Um, I went through early stage breast cancer. You know, my dad died, my sister died. You know, there was a lot, you know, and I'll never forget one of my colleagues at work saying after the whole breast cancer thing, um, he said, God, you know, I have to say, you know, you went through best breast cancer like most people go through a cold. <laughs> and I sort of took that as a badge of honour. Now, I didn't need chemo, at, you know, so it wasn't like I, I I did what I call breast cancer light, but you still have to go through all those fears and mm. stuff and surgery. Someone has and to this drop and that. the C word on you. Someone has to drop the C word. Um, and so, you know, and the, the, so that you look at your own mortality and that's although it was breast cancer light, it, it was still my own experience of it. Um, and so it's not like I hadn't had ability to bounce back and to get on with things. Um, so, so that was one of my problems was like, oh my God, does this mean I'm not resilient? I can't deal with the idea of me not being resilient. You know, I'd always prided myself on being resilient. So there's all these interesting things that were going on level after level. And I think for me, what I needed to learn and, and, uh, you know, one of my good friends is, ha- says this to me over and over again, and he's absolutely correct, is my pushy little brain has managed to get me out of most things in my life. Because I can keep thinking my way through it until I'm out of it. Yeah. But my pushy little brain on numerous occasions has pushed my body to the nth degree, to breaking point, you know, the breast cancer, it's been several of the hospital <laughs> admissions, um, you know, appendicitis, severe sinusitis. I mean, all very, you know, right. um, things that you can go, oh, well, that's nothing. But, you know, all of these things happening in my later life, you know, I got appendicitis in my 40s, you know, and all, and all this sort of stuff that happens partly because you run down, you know. Um, so I your brain's pushing, pushing, pushing. Pushing, pushing, pushing. My, my brain, and I know this, has, a, has an amazing ability to push my body well beyond its limits. And it took being on the floor to actually appreciate that. I didn't get looking it. Looking like, mentally looking like Patsy. With exactly. I just didn't realise. And I, so I'd lived so much in my head. And needed to for my work. I'm not saying that that was not the right place to live, but I'd completely cut off from my body and what it was doing 
and what it needed. Hmm. And that is my struggle. And that is my ongoing struggle is listening to my body. I'm getting much better, but I still do it to myself, you know, but I catch it quicker, but I'll still do that. Gee, I must be coming down with the flu. And then I go, oh, oh, oh. No, it wasn't the flu, was it? Mm -hmm. That was your body saying, back off, brain. <laughs> how does that um, How does that sit with your medical training? And this question sort of developing and coming to me as I'm asking it. Um, and you're dealing with children that have cancer, etc., And yet at the other end, there's yourself living proof of what goes on in your head is actually manifesting itself into your body. How does all that come together and sit where I imagine, and we're going off on one here during medical training, it's the body's seen as like an organism separate to the mind. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so no, you're, yet, very, you're, you're absolutely true. now you're yep, no, totally into mind, body, different. medicine. Yeah. No, look, I think, um, I was like most young um, medical professionals in the early days into the science of it and loved the science of it, you know, and I still do. The The intellectual power that it needs to put A together with B to get C or sometimes D or E is really stimulating. Like the body is amazing mm. and the science behind it all that, and I love that. But there's actually only so much the body can do without the brain being on board. Mm. And so the mind, I think one of the great travesties of sort of 20th century medicine is that we lost the connection between the brain and the body in terms of the way we delivered healthcare. Mm. The Flexner has a lot to answer for in his, in taking away the sort of apprenticeship style of training of doctors and making it into a university degree. And then right. with the development of drugs like antibiotics in the twenties, and then just yeah. the expansion of actually being able to cure things which we couldn't prior to that. We could just heal people with, you know, care, really, yeah. <laughs> when you think about it. Well, it's sort of creating an environment for the body to heal itself. Exactly. It do that. Exactly. As and it can to... from, from many things, not everything. Obviously, it needs help, but we, we moved completely away from that. And we opened up this gigantic hole for, you know, so-called alternate practitioners to jump into. And I think it, medicine needs to wrestle that back. Hmm. We are the right people to heal, but we need to do it from a mind-body perspective. And, you know, it sounds odd coming from a person who's passionate about clinical trials and poisoning children with chemotherapy. I get that. So the other side is that, you know, I was also the one in the unit who would invite people to do mindfulness practice. Hmm. I, got, I got called the fruitarian a lot. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people aren't going to take this on board. <laughs> exactly. But the fact is, for me, the mind body connection is so vitally important. And we really need to wrestle that space back as traditional, if you like, or conventional medical practitioners. That's where we should be practicing. Mm. And yes, I wouldn't do it without the, the chemo. Don't yeah. get me wrong. It's yeah. not that. I, the, the therapies that we give children now have made huge advances and, and are giving children life who didn't, wouldn't have had life yep. in the past. But we need to do more about expanding the mind body connection around that, even in the space of such a, um, life threatening and sort of, if you like, scientifically based practice of oncology. Now in other areas, it should be almost all of how we practice. Hmm. You know, there are certain areas of medicine where it's all about how we get the mind to help the body to heal. Yes. You know, with little intervention where it comes to drugs, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a, there's a great um, DVD, if people are interested, um, called The Connection that a, a wonderful journalist named Shannon Harvey put together a few years ago. And it is so powerful about the mind-body connection. She's an Australian um, journalist who suffered from an autoimmune disease and went on this journey. And, you know, some of it is, every time I watch it, and I watch it a lot, um, I think I've, down, I've, I've paid for it several times, but I kept, keep losing it and I want to see it, so I buy it again. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it is just one of those things that reminds you how powerful the mind-body connection is in every part of our health. You know, it, it, it controls everything. 
And I'm not saying that means we can control every disease by our thought processes. I'm not suggesting that. But we have an amazing capacity to improve our wellness by using mm. our, our minds to help our body to yeah. heal. So, yeah, I, it's for me that's where medicine should be going. And I'm not sure what clinical medicine I'm going to get back into, but I am making plans to get back into something fairly soon. But um, And it will likely be children, but it will be very much that holistic approach right. of mind, body, spirit, because I just separating them has not done us well. Yes, we can cure a lot of diseases now, but we aren't healing people. And we want people to be healed and whole. So that's for what mm. it's worth. <laughs> There's a question that popped up in another podcast couple, a um, few, uh, um, uh, th this was with a guy who was, um, sort of a survivalist outdoor person, put himself in some pretty tricky situations and, and, and faced his own passing at times, almost. Um, you've obviously spent an amount of time dealing with people passing away in death. What's your relationship with death and how do you look at it? Now, after, you know, you talked about 85%, 95%, so there's still that 5 and 15% mm -hmm. that passed away. Yeah. And you'll have had to. How do you view your own mortality and what's your own relationship with death and how does that play out in your everyday life now? It's a really good question um, because I, being in that space, you do get to think about death and, you know, also having lost two primary, you know, relatives, my dad and my sister, and, um and also um, I think part of the Catholic faith and, and tradition and, and feeling like there's a connection, you know, that, that death is part of life. It's not just something separate that happens at the end. You know, so, so for me um, it's always been about living the best life you can for whatever time you have because you actually don't know when it's going to end. None of us do. And... You know, yes, I would like to live a lot more years, happy and healthy, but I also have a sort of acceptance that if my time comes up, it comes up. And, you know, I've just been, I've been reading Homo Deus, um, that book that's sort of a bit about humanism and where we might be going in the future, and it's got me really thinking a little bit about my thoughts and feelings because it says categorically there can be no afterlife and it just makes me laugh because you know the scientist part of me goes yep I get that I get you mm. can't prove it but it doesn't matter I still believe in it yeah you know for me there is something that is transcendent after death I don't know what it actually looks like and what it is but I feel that somehow your spirit goes on mm. I don't know what that looks like but I do believe it yes and so I'm not um I think it's really important to um, to be precious about life but not to take it to such an extreme that people are suffering and there's nothing else happening for them. You know, I do not believe in um, uh, pushing it to the nth degree when someone really ha is at the end of their life. So um, I, on the other hand, I'm not in favour of euthanasia. I know that sounds weird, but I think that from my experience, there are very few people who die with physical suffering in this day and age, as long as they're afforded good end of life care. Yeah. There are a lot of people who die with existential suffering. Yes, I get that. Mm. But it's not the jobs of doctors, I don't think, to cure everybody's existential suffering. Yeah. You know, that is a personal journey that you have to go on. Now, if because of that existential suffering, you want to end your life, that's fine, but I don't think that the medical profession has a place to, to, facilitate, that. to facilitate that. It's just that's my personal feeling of watching children die and how their families deal with it and how um, gentle it can be even in times of great suffering. Um, and I get that there are some people who do suffer at the end of life. There is some physical pain that we have great difficulty with I understand that, but I think the medical profession has a good way of dealing with that that doesn't require us to have euthanasia laws. Right. If that answers the question, big question. <laughs> it is a big question. Super. So looking forwards now for you, what what does um, 
what are the goals and what, what does success look like for Angelo looking forwards over the next five, 10 years? So success for me is picking up on when I'm pushing myself too hard earlier and earlier <laughs> because I find myself still doing it. So that's part of it. So staying healthy. So really keying into my body and getting out of my brain is important to me because I, because for me, contributing fully to making this world a better place is really important. And the only way to do that is to be healthy and happy. Because if you're not healthy and happy, then you can't contribute. And so that's what I'm aiming to do is to be healthy and happy so I can use whatever talents I have to make this world a better place in whatever way I can do that. Um, so I do want to um, get back into some clinical medicine. I'm not entirely sure what that looks like yet. I have some ideas, but um, I think I need to work on myself a bit before I take on the next grand plan. Um, I am very passionate about doctors' health and the health of medical students and doctors, and I've got involved in a few organisations with that, and I want to expand that as well because I think there is a lot we can do in that space, and institutions actually need to change. It's not just about making people more can't, resilient. Can't be burning out heads of department after three years. Ago. <laughs> yeah. It's not sustainable. No, it's not sustainable. Um, so it's not just about making people more resilient. That's important, but we need to start making a change in institutions, and I'm not sure how that's going to work, but I'd like to be part of a process that facilitates that. Hmm. Um I um I want to be a more important part of my niece and nephew's lives. I've uh I'm, they're wonderful young human beings and they're at that age where it's really nice to be um to be the auntie uh because I don't have to be their mum or dad. And so I want to uh do more of that. Um and uh you know my, my other things really are um, I do love the teaching, and so I'm trying to work out how that will all fit together as well. I like being involved in, in medical students' journey um, because I think after 30 years I have a little bit that I can teach <laughs> from my experience of being there in the, in the real world. Yes. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of things. I, do, I am really keen on really making a bigger commitment to my yoga and um, mindfulness, so I'm seriously working out a way to do teacher training. Um, and possibly eventually to use that for kids rather than for adults because I, I do love being with kids. Um, and then, you know, on a purely personal level, see more of the world, take lots of photos, do lots of walks because mm. they're the things I love to do. Where's your next trip? Um, so I'm going to Tasmania um, uh, just after Christmas. So going to some parts I've been before and some parts I haven't, so that will be fun. I go around Cradle Mountain a bit again and Strawn and... Uh, Mount Field National Park, which will be great. Um, but yeah, after that, I've got, I'm making a list, <laughs> which is rather long. <laughs> yeah. Of places I still want to go and things I want to do travel wise. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, if you could go back and talk to Angela just before she's about to go to medical school and give that Angela some advice, what would that be? I think it would be. To be kinder to yourself, to um, and and to trust that you're enough. Who you are is good enough. That um, what you're able to do at each particular point with your set of skills right there and then is good enough. Because you're always going to push yourself. You don't have to worry about the pushing yourself. Mm. So yeah, I think that's what I'd say. Be kind and and know that you're enough. Excellent. And to the young 20-year-old out there who's in thinking about going to medical school, at medical school, wanting to create a big difference further down the track with their career, what sort of advice would you give them? It would be a bit the same. Right. Yeah, be kind to yourself. Know that you're enough and really connect with people. I think that's the real joy in medicine, but it's also where you get the the greatest wins. And so, yes, you know, develop your mind. The intellectual stimulation is fantastic. And some of those moments where things come together and you make a diagnosis, you really do want to go, yes, you know, because they it's it's fabulously exciting medicine on the scientific side. But never lose sight of the fact that there is a person who is suffering from this 
It's not just a body. It's, it's not a body and that you need to heal them, not just cure the disease. So that would be my big thing. Become a healer. Aim to be a healer, not just a doctor. Excellent. Excellent. Well, today has been um, truly special. I've uh, th thoroughly enjoyed it. There's been bits when I've always been in tears myself. <laughs> I felt my chin go wobbly. I've hair stand up on the back of my hand. It's been awesome, and I can't thank you enough for the, this open conversation. Thank you, Bryn. It's been lovely to spend think, some time with you. Yeah, I think um, I'm really curious to see where you go next. Mm. And to be honest, <laughs> down on my piece of paper here, there was like another half a dozen questions, but <laughs> been here for a while. Yes. So, so hopefully uh, you'll come back and come back and tell us how you've been getting on and answer some more questions in the future. I'd love to. Super stuff. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much to the listeners for listening into this. I, I, there's so much in this. There's a real conversation. I'm pretty sure you'll have enjoyed it. Thank you all very much.